Good afternoon and a huge welcome to our grand lecture today with the positive optimistic title on the journey towards a circular economy. To all of you out there watching, thank you so much and a huge welcome to BlocksUp. It is a delight to have so many of you near and afar with us today. Our grand lecture consists of two segments. First, we have the deep dive of our science talks, and I'm delighted in just a few minutes or moments to introduce Bas van der Westerlo from CTT Expo Lab, joining us from Holland. And later, we'll have our Blocks Hub debates with six amazing people joining us to share with us an invigorating and intensive debates. So stay tuned and just a few practical notes. You are watching us on YouTube, and as most of you know, we have a chat function on the YouTube. It does require that you log in. I can only encourage you to do so and ask as many questions and comments as you want. We would love to have you with us in the chat. We are also active on the chat, so feel free to comment, ask questions, and then I will rejoin you later on stage here in a conversation with Bess, and we'll bring your questions with me to that conversation. Now, Bess, are you joining me? Yes, good afternoon, Penelope. Good afternoon, and Bess, such a huge thank you for taking time out and joining us today. I have looked so much forward to your talk. So I will step off the stage and give the word to you, and I'll rejoin you in approximately 45 minutes. And thank you again. Thank you, Panella. Thank you, BlocksUp, for this uh, great opportunity and organizing this event uh, around circular economy and the implementation of circular economy principles within the built environment. I'm uh, really looking forward, and also to the audience, uh, it's a pleasure meeting you in this way um, from Holland uh, to meet you. Hopefully, we will meet each other uh, quite soon um, physically. Um, during the next 45 minutes, I would like to talk about uh, some developments on circular economy within the built environment. Um, and as you will see on my screen, um, you will see one particular project, which is the City Hall Venlo project in the south of the Netherlands. Uh, a project with it, which is realized uh, about four years ago in 2016. And I want to show with you and talk with you about the journey of this whole design process of incorporation of these cradle to cradle and circular principles into the design. Uh, but also uh, share with you the first results of having this project in, in, in use, uh, especially about the effect of circular principles on the, on the business case, uh, but especially as well on the productivity and the health aspect of the people working inside the building, although during the last couple of months, less than before, during this COVID-19 pandemic. But we have great results that I want to share with you on the effect of having this healthy building on uh, the people health and people uh, uh, behave within this, uh, this building. Um, as Panilla said, uh, please and feel free to have any comments or questions on the YouTube channel. Uh, so that we can answer this uh, on the end of, of, uh, of this science talk. Um, you will see me here uh, on the back side of the project, which we call the south facade, is the, the technical facade. Uh, the other one that we, uh, we saw already on the first sheet is the biological facade. So we both have a, um, a, 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 yeah, a technical and biological cycle within the building. Uh, as you can see, um, I work for the Cradle to Cradle Expo Lab. Uh, we are founded around, tw around 12 years ago and focusing on the built environment, on circular procurement, and also on uh, the strategic processes. Uh, we are a non-profit organization, which means that um, uh, we, uh, um, of course, have to make our own money, but uh, advisory work, consultancy, but also we invest in um, the new topics around circular economy that pops up, which are the questions of tomorrow, and we want to answer them as well so that we can make the transition 
uh, and speed them up uh, to, to have more implementation of, of, of these principles in, in future projects. Uh, so our ambition is to raise that bar all over um, and uh, to make more great uh, building projects uh, today and tomorrow. Um, and of course, we, as I said uh, and explained, we want to raise that bar as much as possible. So we are always ambitious and uh, want to go for the 100%. Um, in the meantime, we also realize that uh, the, the project has to be built as well. Um, so uh, we also always have to find a way in uh, being ambitious uh, compared with um, being pragmatic in a way and, and to see what is possible within the context of, for example, budget planning and the demands that are already there in, in the project. Um, but uh, what we will see is that, uh, that this is possible and these two worlds uh, absolutely can come together. Um, before I dive into uh, the practical examples, uh, I want to share this with you and maybe some of you will have seen it uh, before. Um, but this was a picture that um, convinced me around 12 years ago, maybe 13 years ago, on the, um, the difference of a, a, a traditional linear sustainable solution and approach of being efficient, of trying to reduce or uh, minimize our negative footprint we have uh, on the environment um, and what cradle to cradle and circular economy is all about is to create a positive impact to be effective rather than efficient um, or maybe in more simple words uh, less bad is still no good so we try to do uh, the right things instead of doing things right uh, I think that's a very important uh, uh, difference in the approach we can have. Um, so as I said, we, we, we try to go for having that positive impact and add value uh, within the projects. Um, in the meantime, that also means that, that we have to be consciously outside the lines, um, which I mean that, that we have to be aware that some of the people, maybe a lot of people are still in that linear approach and we have to take them by hand and show them, convince them the benefits of another approach. Um, so inspiring, uh, seduce and also help them around the, the road to, to make step forwards into this direction is very important to make things happen. Uh, so we not only go into the, the broad uh, commitment we can, we can have in an organization or a project, but also the deep commitment that we try to find uh, within uh, the whole project teams. Um, I tried to make this science talk as much as possible in a virtual tour, uh, so I incorporated some videos on the buildings that, that, uh, that, that we will see. So this is the Venlo City Hall, uh, just to give you some uh, impressions of the building uh, during my talk. Um, as said, Venlo decided in 2007, 2008 already to build a new building, a new city hall, and they decided that that building should be 100% circular. A great ambition, a great vision, and only compliments to that, but I also have to be um, uh, honest with you, they hadn't any clue what they were deciding at that time. They had an idea of what a 100% circular building would mean, what it, how, it, how it could look like, uh, how, the, how the whole process uh, would look like. Uh, but it gave us the opportunity to work together with the municipality to, to make that happen. Um, so again, compliments to, to the council deciding that at that time already. Um, so how we all started, and, I, and that's the same in, in Holland, it's the same in Denmark, and it's the same across the world, um, we have to tender, or a city has to tender, has to work with public procurement. And normally in a situation how it, how it would look like is that uh, the city would have a tender document and ask for the best design. Um, but we realized that there was no experience on circular building and circular, circular um, um, experience at all um, within the sector. So we did an ask, an ask an other way of, of a tender approach and we did not ask for a design but we asked for a vision. So we asked um, all the architects, and we had 53 architectural firms that wanted to do this job. And we asked them uh, to come up with a vision, 
in a couple of A4 papers to write down how they wanted to achieve this 100% circular ambition together with us, so together with the municipality. So one big example and, and advantage is that it will cost less time for the design teams, uh, but also a, a big advantage is that we became together a team realizing the whole design. So um, it was not already a design with, which was on the table, but we did it together. Um, and what we realized, although that we select all the design partners like architects, like advisors, um, uh, building managers uh, around the table, we came to the conclusion after a couple of weeks and months that the ambition of 100% was kind of declining. So we focused on uh, and we concluded that we had to focus on a couple of teams of areas. So one of my advices would be to always focus on a couple of teams, uh, areas that, that you want to focus on in your project. And for Venlo, this was um, important to have a building that, that generates its own energy, not using any fossil fuels, but I think everybody will have an understanding on that. Uh, same counts about the water aspect. So how can the building purify its own water, reuse it again, etc. Uh, a third theme was around the materials. So how can the building be a material depot, a material bank for the future, um, incorporating healthy materials, no toxic materials that are reused or reusable, um, that contains uh, maybe a residual value or uh, take back schemes, uh, which I want to, talk, want to talk about later on. Uh, so at the end, a building that can be uh, disassembled and has no waste at the end. Um, and four, but definitely not the latest, is how can we create a building that is healthy, a building that has better indoor climate than outside, a building that purifies the air when it goes out, so which is just like a tree having a positive impact on its surrounding. So basically these four teams are the, the, the storyline of, uh, of this building project of City Hall Venlo. But at the end, um, and that I think is really important of making this project a success, that it was not a, a given by the, the left-wing policy on making only the, uh, the, 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 the positive impact on the environment and the social aspect, but also the right-wing parties were involved on seeing this as an economical principle for economical local growth in the area and boost innovation that goes beyond the conventional sustainability. Um, so one aspect where I want to, to dive into is the circular materials. Um, also a very important topic of today during these sign talks. Um, and uh, what we always try to do is to involve these supply chain uh, members and not wait until the moment where we specify the whole design at the end of the design stage. But we early involved in a very early stage these companies and to talk with each other what, what is possible. And we want to challenge them as well, not only see what is already possible, but we want to challenge them how they can work with us together on, 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 high, on, on higher levels of circularity. And that gives them also the time to come up with more innovative solutions. Um, for example, when we sit around the, sat around the table with these companies, during the design stage, we still had one and a half to two years with these companies before the building should be built. Um, so it, it gave them as well a lot of time to come up with these better solutions and contribute to the ambitions that are already uh, described in my previous uh, slide. Um, so share these expectations and share your ambitions. I think really important to, to work on that together. Um, some questions that we always ask, and that brings me as well on, on uh, the subject of today of material passports and building passports, is we always ask to the product composition. So what's in, basically, what's in your product? And I was still surprised that a lot of uh, companies were not, not able to answer that question right away. Um, so that took a lot of time. Uh, secondly, we work with them on, uh, for example, the origin, where does it come from? But also, is it possible to recycle your product? Um, what's about the re reusability? Is it 
degradable. Um, so these kind of, of options we, we want to see and talk with. Um, and the companies that ans can answer these, these type of questions, um, you automatically, automatically come into the discussion of, for example, how could the business case look like? Uh, what about the demountability of your product? Uh, can you easily recycle that? Uh, do you have take-back schemes? And what about business modeling? Um, do you take in mind, for example, residual value? Um, can you work with other business models like leasing or buy with buyback scenarios? So very interesting to have these kind of talks with your supply chain uh, doing these processes. When I talk on this project of City Hall, I think we can conclude that a lot of cradle to cradle certified or equal products like that, uh, that so that are equal to this cradle to cradle certification uh, standard, uh, are used. Um, just for your knowledge, when we started all this in 2009, 2010, the design stage, we had the choice for five, less than five uh, of these materials. At the end, we do have now over 30 of these types of products. So, as I said, we work closely with them together to see how we can um, uh, challenge each other to, to bring us to a higher level. We also uh, had a, a good look at how can we reuse current materials in the building with one condition that these materials should be uh, not only circular but also healthy in a way. And uh, in some cases, like the concrete, for example, of the former building, we have made the decision not to reuse it because we came to the conclusion that it was that there were toxic materials in it. And with the ambition of making a healthy building, um, yeah, we decided not to do so. Um, as said, um, not all the products are already, were already there are already there on the market that um, are in line with these principles. So we also have a kind of backup system that we can work with quick scans to showcase the potential of the products. So when the product is not there yet, we can see if it is in, this, in the same road, the same ambitions as, 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 uh, as the, the ambitions of the project and work especially with these material passports where I will come back on later on um, to, to register, to document the, the quality and the quantity of these applied materials. And uh, what we did as well is to, to write down the dismantling plan so before realizing the building, we knew how to disassemble it again on, uh, on the end of the use time. So this is an example of uh, a material passport that we have used and that we still use today in, in, in a lot of other projects. So it tells you information about asset decomposition of the product that are used. Uh, it gives you insight on the origin, on the reusability, on the toxicity, uh, but also the potential of this assembly at the end of, of the use time, the technical or functional use time of the product. Um, so you see here um, uh, an example, and I think you can see my mouse uh, on the screen. Um, this product consists of 17 materials, and every material you, um, uh, you, you will know which material is in there. You will see the material safety, which means that it is a green light, a green button. Um, it doesn't contain any banned list products. Um, and showing, with a, uh, showing a, a, a red light when there are toxic materials in it, banned list products, or a, a yellow or a, um, uh, um, uh, yeah, a, a yellow sign when um, there are uh, banned list products in it, but they are phased out in, in short notice. Um, then we want to know the material source. So is it virgin? Is it recycled? As I explained, the, the percentage of material source specified, the weight, and at the end, uh, you, will, you will have an insight on your input streams, your output streams. You know what you have, uh, and you will get um, circularity um, uh, data on your products. So that's what I call material passports, uh, having that insight on your products. Secondly, uh, which is in my opinion an, another, um, uh, another way of passporting for your building is a building passport. Um, and you see here an example of that. Um, maybe some of you will recognize on the top of the screen, you will see the levels of brand 
from uh, the side structure to the stuff within a building. And on the left side, you will see the material families that we can recognize, like stone, like glass, like wood, like plastics. Uh, so working with BIM or uh, BIM models, or you can also work with some Excel uh, uh, sheets uh, if, if needed, uh, you will get insight on the quantitative aspect of your building in your, bu in your building passport. Um, very, uh, uh, very good to have that insight for future uh, reusability, reusing products, and to prevent waste at the end of, 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 of the whole uh, uh, project lifespan. And um, the benefit is that you always will get, will get a, a circularity index um, and give you insight in the residual value. Um, and I want to go a little bit into that, that aspect of residual value. Um, as you see here, um, knowing what you have, uh, can make an estimation on the value of your project during the, the next, let's say, 40 years uh, when we talk about the City Hall of Fenlo. Uh, this is uh, uh, an example, so not, uh, not for the City Hall, but you can prevent uh, or make an expectation of the value of your products. But this is not on product level uh, or element level, this is on the raw material level. Uh, so actually, when we see the, the ways of, of, of the, the, the reuse, recycling, uh, reduce, this is only on the, on the recycling rate. Um, during the project of City Hall, we had these interesting talks with the supply chain. And for example, uh, we had to do a, a specific tender for the furniture. And um, we, we concluded that this, this sector was already there in, in making a lot of steps into the direction of circularity. So we were quite confident of asking these questions to the market. Um, and we talked about um, the questions we already talked about, like what's in your product? How do you work with certifications? But we also talked about the topic of residual value. So on the left side, or on the right side for you, uh, you will see the awarding criteria that we used during this public tender. Um, we asked for a vision, which was only 10% of the total score. So we wanted to select a right partner that wanted to team with us, to team up, to, to come up to the best uh, innovations and the best um, uh, fulfillment of, of our ambitions. Uh, secondly, we worked with the cradle-to-cradle -cradle footprint. So let's say a cradle-to-cradle -cradle or circular footprint, which was a knockout criterion which means that we wanted to have insight on the products that, that they want, wanted to use. So uh, when certified, you would have a 100% score on that specific uh, product. If not, we requested the market to fill in uh, a form, uh, a passport, uh, on giving insight on, on the product. When not reaching a level of amount of, of, of points, you would be out of competition. So it was definitely one of the most important uh, awarding criteria. Then third, we had focus on the, the budget. So on the total cost of ownership, and we said the total cost of usage. Um, because Fanlo uh, didn't want to own their products, these products or furniture, they wanted to use it for a period of 10 years. So we came up with a solution to um, uh, to work with, uh, to buy with a buyback scenario uh, that was possible within the tender. And then finally, the aesthetics, with a, which was also 30% of the awarding criteria. So then the results, again, we had really high quality of products with really great economic uh, uh, um, fulfillment. So um, we even had better quality products than we expected and we asked for in the in the program of requirements and uh, the wishes that we had on, on that topic. We also had very high level of cradle to cradle certified or equal uh, products. So everywhere, wherever possible, we, um, we well, uh, we can, they come up, the market came up with, with these type of products. And something that we, we really were surprised on was the residual value. Um, so within the, the, the boundary conditions of the budget, um, we, um, uh, we well the, the market came up with 18% residual value, which means that the city of Fenlo will have around 300,000 euros back at the end of the 10-year uh, contract. 
so six years from now on, um, that they will get back on, on these materials when they decide not to use it for a longer period. And also the supplier said, wait, we uh, realize that we, we will return our own product. So you, Venlo, will not do the maintenance. We will do that for you. Normally you will pay 50,000 euros for that. Uh, but because these become our own products again, we will do this for you and you don't have to pay for that. So a lot of win-win situations. Um, that inspired us as well to go more into that direction of residual value. And we had a lot of talks, as already explained, with, with the supply chain. And we saw a lot of cases, a lot of producers that were interested in, in going into that direction uh, with us. Um, and if we try to summarize that, and we work very closely with TNO, um, uh, uh, which is a research institute in the Netherlands, and maybe some of you will have heard of. Uh, we did that within a climate kick uh, project and we dived into the topic of residual value in the building, building sector. And we started with dividing walls. And secondly, we had focused on, um, on, on the building facades. And we see on average, so to summarize that somewhere between the five and the 40, maybe also 60%, um, we realized already today on residual value on product level. So when you only focus on the raw material, and that's how I started uh, a couple of slides ago, when you only have focus on the raw material, then you will somewhere come up with three to four, maybe five percent of your building costs in residual value. Uh, the potential is much higher uh, focusing on, on, as I said, more the elements and the components within the building. Uh, so, for example, we, we made agreements on uh, residual value on the building facade till 61%. So the potential, you have to think about that, is of course enormous. Um, and we have to go more into that. Uh, we are definitely not there yet, but this is a really nice movement that um, is, is really interesting, I think. Um, next to that, because calculating residual value on a product is one thing, uh, you also have to embed that in your organization. Uh, for example, at a city um, or Fenlo, how to incorporate that. So the scenario two that you see here on the screen is in most of the times is, is, is the case where there is no policy around residual value. Um, so it has to come from the project, the project team, the project manager to incorporate residual value in the product, uh, sorry, in the project. And then you will come up with some examples with guaranteed amount in euros on residual value. But at the end, because there's no policy in the end of, of the project, it will return in the, the cash flows, in the, in the, in the value streams of, um, of the municipality or the, the client, um, and will go back to the, the general means of the organization. So we want to go towards scenario one, where residual value comes into the policy, for example, the investment policy of the organizations where um, uh, residual value is the starting point of the project. They'll go into the purchasing team, the tender documents within the applications, of credit applications. And by doing so, again, you will come up with um, uh, uh, agreements on residual value with producers. Um, and it will be part of your administrations, which means that you can calculate with residual value within your project and it will go into the monitoring system per project. And so by doing so, um, you could have benefits also in the, in the, in the short term on uh, working with residual value. Um, so we also dived into when do you incorporate residual value uh, in such a way? And um, I don't want to go into this uh, very specifically, uh, but you can see that we need a lot of disciplines from procurement to the suppliers, legal, finance, you have to incorporate them on the whole uh, system. And definitely in the first phase of your project, uh, till the, the definitive phase of your product, it's really, really necessary to work very closely with each other uh, to, to work on, the, on that. Um, so for Venlo, imagine if we if we succeeded in 5% residual value, which is 
not very much, uh, as you can imagine. That would mean an extra 80,000 saving every year on the building costs. So also here the potential is, is enormous. Um, I want to go into another subject. Um, as I said, the health aspect is, is really important for a lot of projects and also for um, the city of Venlo, it was one of the main teams. So how can we make not only a circular, but also a, a, a healthy building? And just some food for thought, uh, what do you think, how many percentage of your time are you indoor? Not only uh, now today during this COVID-19 period, but in general. So in general, this is 19%. So a lot of time we are investing inside the building. And if we realize that a building um, is four to eight times, eight times worse in air quality than outside, it's something to think about. Also, maybe just another question, and I can ask you lots of these type of questions, but of the 82,000 chemicals we use for commercial purpose, how many percent do you think has no data for health? It's something I surprised really, it's more than 85%, but we do not have the data on health. So I, I said we can go on with these kind of, 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 of topics, but as I explained, we, we wanted to create a building that has a positive impact, both on the interior and the outside air. Um, so this building again, going back to the city hall, uh, and again, I hope you will see my, my, uh, my mouse. On the right side, we will have a big greenhouse top, uh, topping. So this is actually the, the lung of the building. That's the place where the outside air is inhaled to the inside. There is green, there are trees, there is water. So we uh, try to bring the, 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 the air quality on the right temperature and, and humidity and so on. Then this, this purified air will go to the garage um, and we will use the mass of the building during winter and summer times to heat or cool that uh, indoor, indoor air. And then we will uh, have an open system behind this glass uh, wall. There is a big void structure, an open structure, which is in connection with a solar chimney on top of the building. So actually we have a natural flow from the greenhouse to the basement and then go back to the solar chimney. Uh, so we only have a natural system here. Um, we only have chemical, sorry, uh, a mechanical um, uh, ventilations in the, in the offices uh, um, that has no direct connection to this system. Um, by doing so, and we can include that now in, in, um, in these four years of, of, of uh, being in use, that the indoor climate today is better than outside. So something to think about. Normally, on average, in office buildings, the inside air is four to eight times worse than outside. In this building, the inside air is better than outside. That's, that's quite interesting and quite uh, uh, a success. And also, by having this system with a solar chimney, we don't want to push that, that air uh, going out here on top of the building, but we push that, um, that, that air between the wall and the green wall, and there are some openings within the green wall. Uh, so this green wall purifies the air from the inside when it goes to the outside. And also there we have measurements around the building. We can now conclude that this building purifies over 30% in a radius of 500 meter around the building, 30% uh, of fine dust and CO2. So just like the ambition, this building is really a tree for its surrounding. It looks nice, at least in my opinion, um, it, it creates uh, biodiversity. It is good for um, uh, the heat stress within the surrounding. Uh, and, and there are lots of more uh, benefits of, of doing it this way. So again, a building with, with clean, healthy indoor and outdoor air. Um, so something I want to go a little bit more into detail on is, is that aspect of the measurement of, of all this. Um, because it's nice to, to, to tell that, but I also want to, 
to have the confidence that it's, it's really the case. So we asked the University of Maastricht, together with Aachen in Germany and Berkeley, to work with us on, on, on this. So we teamed up with uh, 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 organizations, both on the Dutch and the German border. And um, what the University of Maastricht did is to doing a survey in the former building of the city. So the, the former city hall. Uh, so that was in 2016 in the summer of July of 2016. And 200, 30, 630 people, participants, did uh, worked on that survey. And 70% and of these people moved to the new building, so to the new city hall. And 30% uh, is still in the same building as they were on 2016 and on forehand. Um, so scientifically, uh, a perfect um, um, uh, possibility to compare um, apples with apples to compare the employees of the same organizations in two types of different buildings, a former building and a new building. Some of the conclusions that we that we can see now today is that there is indeed um, a, a, a difference in how people um, feel themselves in within these types of buildings. So, for example, the air quality is, is absolutely better than it was before. We can Prove that now with the data under measurement. So we measure temperature, humidity, uh, fine dust, CO2 levels, and so on. But also we can now conclude that the people experience that the employees more, pre more um, uh, present, uh, better than, than it was before. We can also see that and conclude that for temperature, we can see that for light, and we see that the noise aspect is quite the same as it was before, which was quite surprising because in the former building, they work in offices for two or maybe three colleagues, and now they work in a open space, uh, an open office area. Uh, so still we see that there is no difference in noise uh, in how people uh, feel th themselves in that situation. What we also can see is that the level of percentage of people that are reporting on sick building syndrome aspects is almost half since um, uh, since they moved to the new building. So we definitely see that this has effect on the people. Um, uh, and we can also see that, and I go back for, for one sheet, is that we see that into the numbers of, for example, the level of productivity, but also the sick rates. So since 2016, yes, so four years now, the sick rates is declined with, uh, reduced with one to one and a half percent. So that's enormous. So that's why we work together with these universities to see if this is um, uh, uh, really, well, what's the reason for this? Um, so imagine that this is the case and that we can make that, uh, make to prove that, that every year, every percent is about 480,000 uh, euros per year that you're saving on your personnel costs. So that's enormous. Um, and that brings me to the uh, final aspect of, of my presentation is also the business case. Um, for this project, uh, again, for the City Hall project, we had a budget of uh, 43 million euros, which is, during the benchmark, um, a, a normal uh, budget for a type of this kind of building. So not an extra budget for making it green or sustainable or circular. So it was a, just a normal benchmark. This building is built in the time of uh, an economical crisis and Venlo had to cut in their budget with over 20 million euros. This was the biggest project so you can imagine um, the question was how can we save money by doing less on sustainability. Um, so we calculated because that was our uh, um, assignment we calculated what can we save by not doing it? And we concluded that by just simply cut a lot of sustainable and circular measures, we could save 3.4 million euros. And I will be honest with you, I think if we would show that uh, business case or the savings, the council um, would be really happy with that and could, could have a, a round of applause and said a big thank you, and, uh, and which would mean a big, a big saving on the, on the total 20 million euros.
But of course, and I think you will have the same feeling as we did, is that when we do that, we will have no ambitions on circularity and sustainability anymore within the project, but it will have also a negative effect on the total business case. So we show them what the 3.4 million measures, like we see here on the screen, what that should mean on the total savings on the building. And then we see on the right side that in a result after 40 years, um, so after 40 years, which was the, uh, the use time uh, written in the policy, you would save 16.9 million euros just by investing in the right things. So we showed them these calculations within the council meeting and they said, well, thank you. Very interesting. We see a, a good payback time in 15 years. Well, actually, uh, 15 years may be a little bit too long, but the return on investment, which is which is good with 12 and a half percent, but still, um, thank you for, for all your work, but uh, well, we have to focus on the short term. So we're going to cut the 3.4 million uh, uh, measures. So that's what actually happened. So when we walked out the building and out the meeting room, uh, we said, well, that was it. Uh, that was the end of, of our journey, making a circular building like this. But we also concluded that we thought they don't understand what, what they decided. So two weeks later in the same council, another meeting, we came back with the same numbers. And the only thing we added was also a cash flow calculation. And we showed them that, and we told them, if you invest in the 3.4 million euro measures, you have to pay your interest, like you and me uh, having a home, uh, paying interest, uh, for your for your house um, and and that that mortgage that um, uh, uh, um, amount of money every year was about two hundred twenty thousand euros two hundred twenty five more or less but the saving on your cash flow on your uh, exploitation costs are around the same uh, number so you see in the first year a minus nine thousand euros but after the first year we saw already a plus. So actually, we could say you don't have to leave anything uh, when you're investing in the 3.4, but you will start saving money from the first year on, uh, and you will save 16.9 million euro during the total uh, lifespan of the building. And also, this was really a, um, a safe calculation, so without a lot of high indexes and so forth. We also didn't include anything on residual value, like we talked about. So we could have incorporated the 5% or more, uh, but we didn't do that. We haven't included the aspect of health in this. Um, I said 1% is 480,000 euros. So we explained that the business case could only be better than it is, as you see here on the screen. And by showing this, um, at the end, the council decided unanimously to work with this, so to go on with this. Uh, and I think a key moment in, in, in making it happen and working around uh, uh, the clock with this, um, uh, with the whole uh, team of, of in, uh, inspiring people and companies. Um, and I can also tell you that now four years uh, being in use, we did a, a, a calculation uh, last year and we see that this business case and practice is even better then we, uh, we have it here on the screen. So we start saving money for Venlo already in the first year, uh, not with a minus 9,000, but with a plus 60,000. Again, without having uh, calculations on residual value or health. Um, so to conclude, uh, and that brings me to the last uh, slide, um, a great journey of working together with, with a, a very big radius of, of, of companies and organizations and making this happen. And we didn't have the knowledge at that time where it would end. Um, and we, as this quote is saying, we don't see the whole staircase, but we took the first step. Um, so I, I'm looking forward and I'm looking forward to the discussion as well, uh, making these steps. And I know you're, you're making steps in Denmark, uh, uh, absolutely. Um, and to see how we can raise that bar uh, in every project more and more. And that, that, um, that's, that brings me energy and um, that, that makes it great and working in this field. 
of expertise. So thank you for that. Um, maybe there are some questions, Vanilla. Um, looking forward to answer them. Uh, and yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you so very much, Bess, and what a wonderful presentation. And we, I almost thought that you had a clock with seconds on it because you finished your, your talk just exactly as we had arranged. So thank you for that. And thank you for those of you uh, watching and participating. You have been very active in the chat, and that is most welcome. So I have some wonderful questions for you, Bess, and I will literally just take as many as uh, time allows. Is that okay with you? It's perfect. Excellent. We have from Franz Leuring uh, the nice question, how can you create an interesting business cake for co companies who are not interested in taking back materials? It's a good question, um, and indeed, um, there are, I think, multiple ways in, 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 in doing that. Um, I think it, it all starts with, um, do, you, do you want to work on circular products uh, here? So what, what does, what does the, the product contain? Uh, is, is, it, is it circular in itself? And it, I think it's not necessary that the same company has to take back the products at the end of the, of the technical or the, the functional lifespan. Um, so we also see, for example, business uh, business modelings with a buy uh, scenario where a third party uh, make the agreements already in the first stage that they will 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 buy it at the end. So it's actually a combination of of, of more uh, uh, organisations in the sector. Um, so I, I, yeah, I, I don't think it, it's it definitely necessary. Uh, it's an option to have a buy buy back scenario. Uh, but there are more options for that, yes. How to define healthy based on what rules? I have to look at, it's a good question, I think. It's a very good question. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that, that's something which is, of course, um, we, we were wondering as well. Uh, and that is the reason why we started uh, the Healthy Building Network. Um, I will share with you later on the link. Uh, to this website of Healthy Building Network, um, uh, where we try to team up with organizations like universities, like I told uh, in my talk, um, uh, to make more definitions around that and to have more metrics and, and KPIs on that. Um, for Venlo, we defined some of these topics. So I explained in the beginning, we had four aspects, so four focus areas, so energy, water, materials, and health. And every um, area had its own roadmap. So we um, uh, tried to um, make every team, every area as smart and specific as possible. So we made KPIs and, and criteria around CO2, humidity, um, uh, um, TVOCs, uh, um, uh, finders, um, uh, temperature, humidity, uh, I think five or six of, of these uh, uh, criteria, yeah. To Franz asking the question, I also know that Joseph Allen and John Macomba that we interviewed in September, they also have criteria on healthy buildings and they would concur with your point best that a healthy building can actually be attributed to increased performances and well-being of the people in the building. So very in agreement with what you have been presenting. And we have a question from Jesper Ring. Did you, the suppliers, or Circular IQ confirm the input in the material passport? A nice question. Again, all good questions today. <laughs> um, yes, we, we, it, 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 it was, you know, Venlo um, embraced the cradle to cradle principles. Um, uh, so, circular economy was not there yet. Um, and I think. Um, uh, the cradle of cradle to cradle for us was was this project that I just explained. So we this was also for us the first time in 2009, 2010 of asking these types of questions. Uh, so working with these material passports, um, uh, we 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 asked them these set of, of of questions, and we had the opportunity to have a third party to check if whether the 
the input that we that we got from them if they were right. So that was kind of a, a, an, an, an extra control on that uh, that we were on the, on the right on the right page on the same page mm. uh, as, as as everybody. A nice follow-up question from Emma Elbeck. How do you gather the information for the material passports? Any challenges that you'd like to share? That's a nice follow-up to, to, to Jesper. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think it's important and I think both also the architect but also uh, the construction companies uh, play a very important role in that. It is, um, as I explained also, uh, involve the supply chain on an early stage. Yeah. Um, just by asking the right questions. So um, by, by working, working with, with these uh, formats of, of material passporting, uh, it's about asking these questions. Um, and it's then for the suppliers um, to fill in these kind of forms and to come up with, uh, with, the, the, with the right answers. Um, and, and in line with the, with the previous question, uh, of course, you, you have to be in control on that. You have to make sure that, that what is said is right. Um, but that gives the opportunity com to compare apples with apples and to see um, how you can uh, evaluate that uh, within the same uh, product uh, category mm -hmm. and also to, um, uh, yeah, to register that for, for the future. And I think again, Franz Leurink, thank you for some excellent questions you're posing. Is there a connection between the material and the CO2 output? that the material produces itself? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, normally not. Um, so within the normal uh, way of, of asking these set of criteria and questions, is, it's not path, but there is an option to include that. So, um, for example, we did uh, recently uh, some tenders on more the civil uh, works or roads and, and, and uh, uh, bicycle roads and, and also a bridge and there we included also the CO2 levels uh, in this building passport sorry the material passport mm. and to those of you watching the procurement and the policy making is something that we'll actually return to in the debate so it's uh, nice that you're also linking it to that I also observed that during your presentation you talked a lot about or addressed the importance of um, the time frame in terms of close collaboration that the earlier the various actors in this complicated process are involved, the better. And France, France also actually picked up on that and has asked, uh, were the users of the building, were they also included in the beginning from the start, as you said that the various uh, suppliers and contractors were? Yeah, France had a very good questions uh, today. Um, uh, not really, of course. Um, well, how, how would I answer? Well, we, we have chosen for deep commitment, um, which means that we wanted to be on the same page with the decision makers. Hmm. Um, so imagine the council, the aldermen, um, uh, the, the team leaders. So that's that's the people we 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 were really worked on together to 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 make the steps on that. But of course, we also had more than thousand employees, and it is not possible to to bring them around the table uh, uh, for that. But we we guided them uh, uh, and and to explain about about our ambitions. And maybe funny to tell here is that, uh, and also especially of not only the employees, but also the surroundings. So the inhabitants of Fenlo, for example, they, they were kind of uh, negative in the beginning. And maybe that's something uh, um, uh, Dutch. But um, we, we, we said, uh, they said, well, why are they investing uh, 50 million euros in a new building? Uh, what's wrong with the old one? But when we start explaining them the story that I've just told, and when the building was there, they became more the ambassador of, of this building. And we see now today that over 40,000 people, so not from Venlo, but from, uh, especially from not Dutch people, yeah. came to Venlo to see the, 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 uh, the building and to have a guided tour, for example. Of course, not during the last couple of months. 
So it's it's also uh, telling the story and, and making people more enthusiastic about it. I can share it's not only a Dutch reaction to be negative <laughs> towards uh, change. I think it's universal in the, the human nature. But it is interesting to see the transition of, of uh, concern and potential reluctance to, to later embracement. I think, yes, Bering, and similar to that, Franz has also asked in terms of the comparison, collecting the performance data. Yes, Bering actually writes very, again, excellent question. You compare the new building with the old one. How does it compare to other modern office buildings when asking the users? Yeah, and, and then it's especially about the health aspect, of course, right? Um, uh, Yes, yeah, so we, we use the same uh, monitoring systems in the old, uh, so the current buildings and the new building. Uh, but we also compare, well, not we as C2C Expo Lab, but the University of Maastricht, for example, with um, uh, schools, so education, uh, other office buildings. So also then we, we can conclude with the data we have from the new city hall that there is always a improvement uh, on people, how they behave in a building or how they feel when they move towards a new building. Uh, so there are uh, there is knowledge around that. Above all that, we see the extra one to one and a half percent uh, on, for example, the sick rates that is reduced, like I explained before. So yes, um, it's not only comparing the old with the new, it's also comparing old and new uh, set, uh, uh, city hall van law with comparable offices or even education, for example, uh, with the data. Interesting. Franz has two questions, but I'm going to keep one of them. One goes to the responsibility of the producers regarding the material passport, but I think we're going to finish on one of the questions because I also wanted to ask you that one. What are the biggest lessons learned of this project? Yeah, good question, and, and, and a uh, question that has often uh, been asked. Um, if, if, we, if, if we had the opportunity to do this again uh, for the same uh, uh, city, um, there would be some things that we would do different, and there are some things that are absolutely key factors. And I think the most important thing is that we started, so that's a key lesson of um, uh, work from an ambition and a vision. So first, make make your vision clear uh, for yourself, uh, for your commitment internally, but also for uh, for the rest of of your supply chain and and, and people you're going to work with. Um, secondly, uh, circular procurement is a big enabler uh, to to make that happen. And I think we will go on with that during the debate afterwards. Uh, but circular procurement is a big opportunity to 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 make that happen. And, and then, of course, also, and I, I leave it to that if, if it's about the, the, the key moments, is the business case. Um, for us, that was a key moment to, to make it happen. Otherwise, we won't have a building like that. Yeah. On the other side, um, and I think that's also a big lesson learned, is our first ambition was how can we make from the old building the new building? So can we reuse the old materials into the new building? And I think that's a great idea of within a circular economy, but we came to the conclusion that they were really, like I said, uh, very briefly toxic in the old old concrete. Um, so that would be something we wanted to work on more closely for future projects. Mm -hmm. How can we do that in a right, right way? Um, uh, I think I, that's a very, very interesting point. And we'll certainly pick it up on the debate because we have... Uh, XN with us that have the whole criteria of design to disassembly. So I think that is a very good point and a reflection to, to finish on. I know, Bess, if you were here and we had the viewers with us physically, you would be met with such a round of applause right now. It has been absolutely amazing and a deep dive into City Hall in a way that we could not have imagined. And as much as I look forward to it, you have by far exceeded my uh, anticipation. So thank you so very much. To you watching, again, thank you for participating. We're going to give you a more than deserved break. You have time to stretch your legs, maybe freshen up on your coffee or get another snack. We will reconvene here with the debate in about 30 minutes.
So thank you to you as well. It has been such a pleasure and we will return shortly. Stay with us in 30 minutes. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you so much for your patience. And I can easily say that it has been like a rowdy crowd in here, although virtually our wonderful panelists took it with a smile and uh, used the break to get even more acquainted. So that was lovely. For those of you who patiently waited for the introduction, which had apparently a very bad audio, of course we will be fair and do it again. So Emma, apologies. But now we have a very good audio, so please, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the debate. Thank you for participating, and I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you, and uh, yeah, apologies for the, the sound, but hopefully now is all good. Um, thank you for inviting me to this discussion. Um, really excited to hear what we've all got to say and talk amongst ourselves. Um, my background is in environmental science, so I work at Arup um, at the moment, leading our sustainable development offering from the Scandinavia region. Arup is a firm um, made up of 14,000 staff approximately uh, globally, and um, we work on many different projects across the built environment and infrastructure. And we are made up of engineers, architects, consultants like myself, um, and many others, as I say, um, globally. Thanks. Thank you so very, very much. And Josine, on to you. Yes, thank you very much, Vanilla. My name is Josine Peak, and I'm head of Europe, Middle East, and Africa for GRESB. And GRESB is a sustainability benchmark for real assets, um, real estate, and infrastructure. We have currently over 5 trillion of assets coming together, sustainability data on them. And this data gets gets together, we validate it, we peer benchmark it, and we pass it on to the institutional investors to help them navigate this changing environment with good sustainability data, which is a, a necessary element in, in this process. Thank you so much. And also thank you for taking time out to participate today, Josine. And Tona, you're, you're joining us from New York and you've been up very early to help us today. So I'm very happy to introduce you and let you welcome yourself to the audience, our viewers. Thank you so much, Penille. And that is true. Uh, this morning from New York City, my name is uh, Tone Sønergaard and I'm the director of the Danish Clean Tech Hub here in New York. The Danish Clean Tech Hub is a strategic partnership between the Confederation of Danish Industry and State of Green, both organizations from back in Denmark. Our aim and goal here in New York is to bridge and knowledge share with the Europeans and Americans and uh, hopefully uh, create some interesting uh, solutions and showcase what is going on in Europe and how it's relevant also to the uh, American audience. Um, me personally, I've been working with this company for the last six years and uh, within the circular economy, it's really a topic that we have been taking on a lot uh, within the last three or four years approximately. Uh, one of our major ways of doing that is by hosting the biggest circular economy festival in the US called Circular City Week New York. So that's very much one of the vehicles we use to drive this knowledge sharing on circular economy and also within the built environment. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. Now we take it to the gentleman. Bas, a huge welcome to you. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Penelle. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Bas van der Westerlo, uh, checking in from the Netherlands today. Um, I'm a project manager at CTC Expo Lab for circular construction and circular procurement, uh, having a background in architecture, building and planning, uh, focusing on uh, mainly circular uh, procurement and circular construction, uh, as explained. Uh, just had the opportunity to do the science talk um, before this debate on uh, a great project we did before on, for example, the City Hall project uh, in Venlo, south of the Netherlands. We are a non-profit organization, so we're only working on pragmatic implementation of circular, circular economy, but also uh, investing in uh, new research questions to answer the circular questions for tomorrow. 
So uh, thank you, Panetta. Back to you. Thank you very, very much. And Jesper, also a huge thank you for you to for participating today. And the again, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Jesper Miner. I'm from Miner Change Group, founder of Miner Change Group. We are a business development company. And in 2011, we started working with Circle Economy uh, together with Central Denmark Region and have since been working with Circle Economy and a lot of different businesses uh, within different sectors. Uh, the last couple of years, we have developed our, some projects on our own. So we have uh, companies within uh, water treatment and and also within furnitures and so on, uh, paint uh, development and so on. So we have invested in, in different sectors. Uh, in the construction sector, we have been part of regional projects. We have been working with concrete. We have been working with development of new mortars so we can separate uh, the bricks from each other. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, upcycling of wood, a lot of different projects, and uh, so I have quite a uh, some experience within the, the construction sector, uh, even though we have a broader view on the circular economy. Thank you. Well, thank you. Last but absolutely not least, Cole, I'll pass the word to you. Thank you, Camilla, and, and good uh, afternoon, everybody. So my name is Cor Polesko. I'm Head of Innovation for 3X and Architects and GXN Innovation. We are an architects and research uh, company, or rather two companies, but working together very closely and sharing uh, the same office. Our head office is here in Copenhagen. We've got offices in Stockholm, Sydney, New York, and in London. And we've been working uh, with the circular economy in designing construction for the better part of 10 years. So both doing research work, uh, figuring out what is the circular economy, how can we do this technically, but also increasingly realizing circular design and construction projects uh, across the world. Thank you so very much. And as you, the viewers, would already have ascertained, we have a diverse and extremely qualified group of panelists to embark on today's journey of the debate. And Tuna, when I spoke to you earlier this week, I said, oh, didn't the earth just sigh with relief a few weeks ago when we were told that the president-elect is Joe Biden? Uh, there is hope for the green transition. That's, that's very true, Panille. Uh, definitely, I think everyone over here has been walking around a little bit anxious uh, for the last uh, couple of months, waiting to see how uh, this election went. Um, and as you all know, of course, it, it turned out for a, a democratic victory. And, uh, and I don't think it's uh, any secret that in cities like New York, where I am, and, and many other of the larger cities over here, um, it, it really was a, a, a sight of relief. Um, I will. I could uh, report from uh, streets of uh, people really sort of uh, being joyful, and I don't think that many champagne bottles have never been left in the streets of New York before. Um, so it so it definitely was sort of a a, a, a big relief and a sign of of a different future. I think in terms of what we're talking about today, uh, there is hope at least that uh, that a new president will also mean that. Uh, that the U.S. will be rejoining, hopefully, the Paris Agreement, and and uh, President-elect Joe Biden has also been out uh, saying that he will lean heavily on mayors all over the U.S. Uh, to to create more progressive policies, also on local levels, uh, because of course, as uh, everyone is aware, it isn't only the White House that decides. Uh, what the energy use looks like in the U.S. or how we build the buildings over here. Uh, it is very much also a state and local responsibility. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, so hopefully good news um, and uh, yeah, sign of relief. Absolutely. We have hopes that the next frontier of green solution is now. And uh, let's do you have you also seen that from the investment perspective, Josine? Have you also felt that sigh of relief? Yeah, it's really interesting. What's what's we keep on in, in the um, investment world? We keep on calling it. This is the inflection year. 2020 has been such an important year from so many perspectives, but and, and also political indeed. But uh, on the investment side, it's the inflection year. So for, for uh, Gress was, was started 10 years ago. So for 10 years, 
you know, the, the for more forward looking uh, institutional investors have been gathering sustainability data. 2020 is really the moment that they have been re that large pension funds and large insurance companies have come to the conclusion that our problem, we have collective problems and we will only be able to solve these problems in a collective way. So there's a real moment of, of realization that the, the, the old paradigm for, for all it's worth and it has, you know, it has, it has done a lot of good also, but it is not up to, up to standards for this new, these new climate change problems, uh, social problems, you know, this, this one world uh, approach to, to, um, to problems. So there's, there's definitely a, a clear, not a sigh of relief uh, in a way, there's much more an, a, a, a re-energizing of these institutional investors. I like to compare them a bit to sleeping giants, which are waking up to their, their power and their ability to, to allocate capital in a good way. I like that metaphor. And I know that when we also uh, talk together, one of the things that we actually really quickly agreed on is that it is a, also a sigh of relief that we no longer have to discuss the why, whether this is actually critical. Uh, but we can take it to the level of, of the hows and the whats. And I think this is also where you guys come in and play such a wonderful role because you have so much experience in the hows and the whats. And I know when I, I interviewed you, Cole, prior to the debate, you actually said, well, listen, there, there is a, a myriad of experience that we are already working from. So there is a nuance in, in the hows and the whats. Yeah, although I would, I would add very humbly that, you know, we... we um, we, uh, th there, there is indeed, um, the sustainability is not yet circularity. So, you know, we, 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 we look at greenhouse gas emissions and we look at water usage and waste and, uh, that, so, and, and health and well-being and tenant engagement and all these things. But that, those are, I would say, still quite, quite it's, it's, it's a good ground to start on. But I'm, I'm here, part of this group as well, to learn from what, what kind of metrics would be important to start measuring and then start competing on and start improving on in this um, to, to really move this, these, these trillions of, of assets towards circularity. And, and that is a perfect lead to you, Ko, in terms of, of, of providing Josine with some of that input to the metric. Sure, I mean, uh, very happy, happy to do so and, and happy to be engaging in this discussion. I, uh, I kind of like this notion of uh, 2020 being, being an inflection point. I think we are seeing from our side, which is very much on the industry side, uh, quite a lot more attention around the circular economy. And, and that sort of link between circular economy and sustainability metrics and value metrics is really where we are at at the moment. This is where the work needs to be done. So if we talk about the hearts and the what's, I think for our perspective, developing circular economy in the built environment has really been a series of developments that are all important. So, so the first one was, was developing the conceptual framework. So what are we actually talking about when we talk about circular economy in the built environment? And we published a book uh, some time ago where we looked into this and we decided to say, you know, we have these three focus areas. We want to look at the business case. We want to look at how to design for this assembly so we can take components apart and reuse them. And we want to look at material tracking or material passporting. So there's a conceptual development there. And, and of course, we can always become better. We can become better at standardizing and, and really making sure that we're talking about the same things when we're talking about this. I know Bas probably has some, uh, some good points there as well. But from there, then, we have been developing technical solutions. And we are now demonstrating that these solutions work. And I think what we're getting to now is that we know what we're talking about. We know more or less how to do this. And we also know that there are very, very good engineers and designers out there that can help us meet this and further develop the technical solution. So what we need to talk about now is, is really what value does this bring? What value does it bring for the environment? What value does it bring for the people that are using the buildings? But also what value does this bring for the uh, decision makers? So the investors and the developers that are looking for ways to um, create buildings and, and, and find value within the circular economy while also doing good for the environment. And that's, that's where we're really focusing now and where there's a lot of interesting stuff happening. Yeah, and, and, and you've actually identified some various aspects of the value propositions. 
Could I ask you to elaborate a little bit on those value propositions, Cole? Sure. And I mean, I don't believe this is an exhaustive list, and I'd be very happy to hear from everybody else in the panel about this. But but we have sort of three value propositions that we're looking at at the moment. One is, is reducing project costs, and I can explain a little bit about that in a second. Another one is increasing material value, so making sure we get the most out of the materials we're using. And the final one that we're really looking into is, is reducing portfolio risks uh, for, for developers or building owners. So if we think about uh, reducing project costs, um, the circular economy is, if not collaborative by definition, then at least in the built environment, intensely collaborative. Uh, we are all designers, uh, developers, uh, engineers, producers holding a piece of the puzzle, and we need to be able to put that puzzle together through these collaborative projects. Um, if we find better frameworks for collaborating, we really believe we can create simpler building systems. Uh, we think we can create better processes, reduce transaction costs, and thereby bring down the costs of, uh, of a project. And so, for, uh, as an example, we, we, have, we are part of a larger project here in Denmark called uh, Circle House. This project looks to build 60 uh, social housing units with the uh, housing associates in LIBO as client. It's funded by the Danish EPA and Real Dania. But the core idea with this project is to demonstrate that we can do this. And, and, to, order, and to do so, we, we brought 35 partners from across the building uh, value chain together and sought to develop the products that were already out there into a more circular manner. And so one of the things that happened here is we were looking at design for disassembly at a superstructure level, so uh, at, at concrete uh, components and elements. And through that process, we simplified the superstructure of these houses immensely. So that now we actually have just three core elements. We have these uh, floor slabs, we have beams, and we have walls. Um, so then, and then we are creating these in ways that they are actually put together mechanically, so you can take them apart again. And we build a demonstrator here to to show the industry that this is possible. And what we found when we put the demonstrator up was because we had a simplified system with mechanical joints, we actually had to spend 10% less time than we expected on erecting this demonstrator. And so here we are looking at reduced time on site. And I, I believe this is something that developers should be quite excited about. Um, we'll see once we go up to scale if, if this still holds, but, but there is something about reducing costs there. If I can just quickly spend some time on the two others, if we talk about increasing material value, this is the idea that um, as, as, as we know, that the built environment generates a lot of waste, and that waste is, uh, is, is crushed down usually. So concrete uh, is not used at an element level, it's crushed and used for road fill, and it doesn't retain the value it has. Um, there's different ways of preparing for that, but we have a very interesting case for, for this residual value in a project called the Key Quarter Tower in Sydney. So this is a large um, tower that, that 3XN are designing. And one of the things they were looking at was looking at the existing tower on the side there and are basically upcycling a large part of that tower and using that as, as the core for the new tower. And that means that we can actually use 50% less materials for the new project. It also means that there's, again, a lot less time on site, both for demolition and construction. And we're actually saving the client, uh, by their own estimate, 500 million kronos. So nothing... Uh, pretty big chunk, uh, that's about 80, I believe, uh, million euro. And we're also saving 7,500 uh, 7, uh, tons of, of CO2 and embodied carbon by not having to create all these new uh, materials. So there's really a lot of impact to be had if we start thinking about how we can increase the material value. And finally, on the portfolio risks, uh, this is the idea that we can create a more adaptable and flexible uh, build environment, something that can adapt to new uses, something that is more transparent if we use material passporting. And we're working with a client in, 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 in a project, in a tower project right now, who has this very interesting approach to this. And, and they're basically saying the best way to future-proof this product is to minimize the environmental footprint and build in adaptability and transparency. So make sure that we know what we have in the building. We are optimized for carbon, operational and embodied. And thereby, actually, they believe that they are able to meet market demands in the six years it takes to meet the builders and also potentially have a portfolio if, if they keep reproducing this across the portfolio that is able to withstand uh, forthcoming uh, legislation around carbon, for example. So these are three key uh, value propositions that we're working with. So reducing costs for projects, uh, increasing material value and reducing uh, risks for, for building owners. Excellent. And, and Emma, you have a, point, a comment to this? 
I do, yeah. Um, really, really interesting uh, to hear those sort of three different angles. I was just wondering, sort of tying it with um, what Josephine was saying about sort of investment. How um, how early do you think the engagement needs to come from a client perspective in those cases? Because obviously, with the first example, you know, efficiencies, you need the supply chain to be able to respond and deliver um, and then particularly in the sort of the last uh, the latter point you know it's obviously really important that the client is um, you know that the end client is sort of involved throughout the process so just wondering how that yeah works. no I, I believe I mean a large part of a project is set in those early stages when the client determines the the business case the investment horizons the risk appetites all these kind of things and these are times when we traditionally are not necessarily involved as architects. And, and I think that that's coming back to the inflection point is, is I think we as architects and consultants need to start thinking a little bit more about what we're doing and how we can talk about the value for clients uh, so that they can, can so it works within the models that they're working with. And also very much thinking about these time horizons. I think they're super important. Mm -hmm. it, it, residual value is an interesting value proposition. But 60 years is a long time for a developer uh, and, and or whatever, you know, if you're building something around 40 years, that's still too long for, for some. So thinking about how to communicate the value of this in ways that allows uh, uh, developers to, to build the case around it. And also thinking about how we can create value in, in both the short, medium and long term. Yeah, because I think it's also really interesting from that perspective of that with circular economy, things aren't necessarily, the value isn't realized in the first cycle or the first loop. You know, it's quite often the second cycle or if the products are reused in, in, in the next sort of phase of their life. So um, from a building perspective, you know, maybe um, as, as engineers and consultants, you know, trying to challenge the client, but it's also, I think, quite difficult to, um, as you say, communicate the value at that point of, you know, the initial phases. So um, I think it's interesting to hear um, also from a context of some an investor perspective that they're actually starting to think more along those lines so it, it, it does make it easier but absolutely you know our our job isn't over you know we've still got to keep keep pushing our clients to to start looking at those different um, time horizons and different frameworks no I, I, I agree with you Emma but but I do think that that Traditionally, we've been looking at circular economy as, as a material economy and the value as, as a material value. But, but I think what we can also start seeing is that there are other ways of generating value with the circular economy. So, for example, by having these better collaborative frameworks, which can actually reduce uh, costs in the here now. So, so actually CAPEX, which, which I know is incredibly important for, for building projects. So it's also about thinking about value at, at, at different timescales and in different ways uh, to be able to move forward. Definitely, so, yeah. so to, to, to just understand what you're saying, Ko, is also that we, we still have a language to develop in terms of what, what kind of value and when during the process we're, we're talking sure. about. Sure, I mean, uh, how, do we, you know, how do we realize value and in what time frames do we realize the value on? I mean, some investors, institutional investors, and I'm, I'm sure Josian could tell us about this, they can afford to take that very long-term perspective and think about their portfolio, think about residual value, but it, that, that's not everybody and that's not necessarily how a building case is, is put together. And so I think we need to develop different types of value processes into different types of investors and developers and, and be able to be quite clear about that. So, so it really makes sense uh, from, from where the decision makers are sitting as well. And I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to just to comment on that in a second, Josine, but just to, to give Baz an opportunity because you've actually just presented a, a, a really good uh, business case and have also identified some value propositions. So I thought I'd give you a chance to comment on, on course uh, value propositions and reflections and then uh, Jesper would also like to comment afterwards. Yes, well, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, I totally agree with what's, what's already been said on the value propositions. And um, I also agree on when I look back for now over 12 years, I think the first 10 or 11 years was especially about the why. Why should we all do this? Why do we have to make this transition towards a circular economy? And we know that these types of paradigm shifts need a lot of time to, to make that transition happen. So maybe 10, 20, maybe even more years to make that wheel shifts uh, uh, take place. 
Uh, but I totally agree on, on these value proposition and especially the residual value. Uh, I think there is a huge potential on um, having residual value within the business case of, of uh, the circular economy. Uh, indeed, I just showed uh, of some examples that there is a business case on circular economy uh, that you can save and earn money on doing the right things uh, for your clients. Um, not only on energy and water, but also the materials uh, can take place in, in that whole uh, shift. Um, of course, and that's what Carl already even said, uh, for example, for furniture, um, it is quite easy to make that transition and, and have residual value be placed in that, in, that, in that loop. But also, for example, for dividing walls, facades, and even other uh, building aspects, uh, residual value can be very interesting to have a look at. Um, maybe one value proposition that I want to add here is also the aspect of health, uh, because I think circular economy indeed is the perception most of the time is based on materials. Uh, I think we all agree that it is much wider than only that. Uh, but I think that a, apart from having the shift towards the circular economy materials, that also, even in this time of the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, that it is really um, important to having a healthy building as well. Uh, we're working from home, uh, we're working from normally in offices that are not designed to have a healthy working place or place to live in or have education or something else like that. So I think it becomes more and more uh, important to take that in consideration as well. And um, we see that, that um, the effect of that, uh, having non-toxic materials, which is one key enabler on that as well, but also having natural air flows, uh, uh, healthy indoor climate, um, will have an effect on you and me. I think we all understand that uh, and feel that in our, in, in, well, in everywhere in our body. Uh, but we have to incorporate that as well in the value proposition and the business case we, 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 uh, we show to our clients. Um, and maybe in the first run, we have to prove that on the things we can really calculate because that's, and you see maybe you can, can add on that, but that's where the decision making is made. But please take in mind that there is more than only the numbers on economics, uh, that we have also other value propositions uh, that are very, very important uh, to make this transition. And Jesper, I had a follow-up to, to Bess, but Jesper, I, I promise that when you raise your hand, I will give you the chance to comment, so I'll give the word to you. I, thank you. I totally agree also with Bess uh, that I think that it will be the next level of circularity, the health and so on. Uh, on course, uh, I, I, I like the idea of the process, um, that we have to maybe focus more on the process to get this really running. So how can we support the process and make it more efficient? Because I think right there we have uh, reduction in cost. And we have pos uh, the possibility to really set off and make this implement, implement the circular economy uh, worldwide. So how, Emma and Cor, do you think, how can we support the process and make it more efficiently? Uh, the process. Uh, we can talk about prefabrication and all that, uh, but how can we take this process to the next level? Because when we look at Europe, the productivity is so low. So there's no. It's it's a sector that is it's conservative and it's a uh, it's really not moving fast. So how are we going to change this? Uh, that I think the potential is huge. How are we going to implement it? That's. Uh, a, that's uh, maybe you could give a comment on that, because what we see also on the product level, the the circularity, the cost of the products, it may be a, it will be a bit higher, often because it's, it's not industrialized yet. So, if we look at the process, I think there could be a really option to kick off this uh, circular economy. So, yeah. Before before you comment, just for, for uh, the, in terms of the process and time as a value proposition, because Bess, when you presented at our science talks just an hour ago, you actually also pointed out that one of the aspects of the success of Venlo City Hall was that every actor part of the construction process were collaborating on this for two and a half years prior to the building commencing. So I, I, 
maybe you can also just add to that in terms of cost point of value propositioning and then a quick comment to Jespers. Yeah, I agree, and it is it is something which not happen overnight. I think we all agree on that. So, um, uh, what what um, I think is very important here as well is that we incorporate also the supply chain, the, the companies we work with, uh, on a very early stage. And I think that um, I think it's already mentioned, but also circular procurement um, is 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 one big enabler on that. But uh, when you are around the table as a design team or construction team. I think it's very important to have these uh, supply chain members uh, around the table as well on a short notice um, so that you give them the time to, innov uh, to have innovative solutions and to develop them as well. Um, City Hall, as an example, took the place for design phase for two years, two and a half. So when we invited them in the first weeks and months, they had still two years for innovation time, which is free to them. And uh, we promised them if you are there where we want you to have, we will incorporate you in the project. Um, and I think that's really, really important to have subjects like residual value, like material passporting, um, like uh, health um, uh, as part of the discussion and on the agenda. Uh, and um, what I am really happy with is that uh, a project like this, like City Hall, is a big catalyst, an enabler for new projects that wants to be or even better or try to kind of copy paste what they have seen and incorporate it in their development. So there is a, a, um, uh, uh, yeah, a movement going on that you, that you want to see here. Hmm. And Paul and, and, and Emma, would you like to comment on, on Jesper's question? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to jump in, Carl. <laughs> um, but just reflecting actually also on what Baz just said as well, I think for I think one of the key things that we need to do is and, and to support, I think, is, is partnerships um, across all sorts of different levels. Um, so I think there's, you know, um, Cora, as you mentioned, the, the sort of decision makers, but they are also at, at, at policy level. Um, and then how can that enable um, through on, you know, manufacturing level, so down through into the supply chain? Um, because I think there is also quite a significant challenge in the introduction of um, new policies which obviously we need to um, have in place but I think there's quite often a pushback and you know a lot of organizations decide or feel less inclined to do something unless the policy is there so you know how do we use that as an enabler rather than as a, a barrier to, to, to stopping to do things and I think um, working closely with manufacturers and, and those organizations that are designing innovative, say that word, but uh, you know, creating new products that are circular or perhaps new business models around circular products. So, um, you know, products as a service type approaches, but making them accessible for then the clients that are making the decisions, because at the moment there is quite a, a gap, I would say, in terms of the accessibility to both the types of materials, but also the cost. And, and that's something that then when you come down to a decision on a project level, to suggest or propose certain material choices, it quite often gets value engineered out because of, of costs, which um, I think, you know, the value proposition core that you were making as well, you know, we need to communicate that better as well. So I think f from our perspective, it's certainly supporting through partnerships, but across a multitude of different levels um, and engagement points, I think. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that, and it, it is a good question from Jesper, and, and unfortunately not one we have a have a quick fix for. Uh, but but I do think there's a couple of, of, of points here. Like one is uh, the value of demonstrator projects. Bas was just talking about uh, the project in the Netherlands that he was presenting before. We have the Circle House here, and these projects can work because there's the external funding, either governments or or others that are putting in for them. So. In these demonstrators, we do get to find new ways of working together and, and demonstrate the value. I think that's the first step. But I also do think, and this is the inflection point again, that we've gotten to the point where we actually know what works and what doesn't. Of course, there's still issues, and of course, things would be value engineered out. But I think it's a question of finding the ambitious developers and the project teams that can actually deliver uh, and then work with them. And we're seeing that commercially in, in, in a few of our projects at the moment. So it's, it's, it's also a question for the, the industry now to, to step up and really try and, and, and 
to uh, we need some leadership from the from the people who can actually do this to show the way forward document the value and then i think once we have no, enough projects documenting that that's going to further go further into the industry and of course i think i mean we can also what are the parameters we're going for it shouldn't just be be money of course uh, carbon is an interesting thing and, and that's where we start talking about policies i mean we can change the framework of what's important in projects if offset costs become high there's a whole different incentives to start looking at embodied uh, embodied carbon and, and ways of bringing that down so um, obviously there's a, there's quite a few approaches but but i think we shouldn't um we shouldn't be too wary right now of saying that we actually kind of know a lot of this already and it's about finding now the commercial partners that are willing to take leadership and show the way forward here i totally agree on us before uh, i i hand the, the give the word to to uh, josine yes one one com comment or what i would like to add and i totally agree with what's been said here uh, and i think um progress over perfection maybe uh, because I know some work from Arab, I know work from GXN, I know work from Minor Change Group, and I think something we we have in common here is that we are doing it, um, and that that we try to make things happen and make step forward. And I think we all can can agree that it's not 100% perfect, of course, but we're making the step into the direction and make it make it transparent. Let's show what the values are and try to raise that bar all over again uh, in the new projects. I and mean, indeed, we need leadership. We need, we need the examples um, to, to move this forward. Uh, but please start doing it uh, and don't wait until the moment we are there on 100% level because then we lose a lot of time. Just reflecting on that, I completely agree. And also from a policy perspective, I think that's sometimes where we have such an issue is that it needs to be perfect for policy and it's not the case in, in the real world. You know, we need that flexibility from a policy perspective to enable, like you say, things to actually be delivered on site and, you know, use different types of materials. It doesn't always fit into a very formatted policy landscape. So there needs to be a bit of a almost gray areas. But at the moment, it's quite a traditional process from a policy perspective. So I think that's why things take so long and, and it's quite an archaic system um, in terms of developing those policies and I hope you know I still think and based on I think as what you were saying as well that you know if we push as industry um, and you know consultants and deliver these projects we can almost prove that we're going over and above the policy already that you know this works you, you know you can write the policy afterwards <laughs> um, but we need to just get out and practice and do that yeah. And, and are the investors responding to the fact that we have companies we, uh, that are ahead of the policymaker, Josine? Are they responding because you already uh, presented and argued the case that the, the, the pension funds are ready to make those long-term investments because yeah, they know might, the need I, I, is there? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to give a, a bit of, um, how do you say, again, a metaphor, if I may. So institutional investors, and actually Bus also made the point, um, our, my world is very much a world that focuses and hones in on certain metrics. That's, that's how we've been trained. And uh, to be clear, um, for the last hundred years, so that's not nothing, we've basically honed in on one variable, which is money. You know, this is millions of people coming together and op optimizing on one variable. And I like to compare that to like a big, a big column, you know. Uh, it's, a, it's a mechanistic type of reductionist um, worldview, I would, I would argue, and it worked really well. But now we see all these variables. We start with the more easy variables, which is, you know, opera operational carbon that looks just like money. Instead of maximizing, you need to minimize. So that's something we can, we can grasp quite easily. But already uh, embedded carbon is a lot more difficult to, to, uh, to calculate. And then we have the much more human-centric variables, which, to be honest, we don't even have yet. So we're we're still struggling to get metrics for you know um, how people feel, social, etc. So if where where this column uh, built in a hundred years, I would argue, um, uh, is very mechanistic and is based on Excel spreadsheets, this other environment, this non non-financial data environment, is much more an organic setup of. A lot of people coming together collaboratively, bringing data together, and then hopefully optimizing on certain metrics together. So it's 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 truly a different for 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 these institutional investors. It's truly a different ball game, 
and we're in the we're we're I would say at the very start of this this new world perspective of bringing data together and and collaborating in a different way together in this financial world. Yes, yeah. exactly. And as you said when we talked, uh, Josine, good data or good decisions are based on good data, and good data requires that we actually know the variables uh, in order to compile the data. And I think some of the things that uh, you've all touched upon now is that we are acquiring so much experience and knowledge that we're beginning to be able to identify the variables. I have a question to you, Josine, from the audience and uh, or from the viewers, and thank you very much. Uh, we have from Line Grütnusen to Josine, Collaboratively, you've, you mentioned in your introduction in terms of the value of collabor uh, collaborative, and uh, Lina is asking you to elaborate because we know that that is core to ensuring circular economic solutions. So could you elaborate in terms of how you ensure the collaborations? Yes, yeah, sure. And I, I, I will also just, you know, we, it's not, it's, we, we do use the current hierarchy that is the, the hierarchy prevalent in, in, my, in this market. So we put the um, we we are firmly hierarchical in the sense that we say the institutional investors are the guys, the information takers, and they tell us the variables that they find important, and then we let the managers report on those variables. So both uh, we we have uh, an investor board where all the investors come or a group of investors come together to help us navigate which items, which which variables to to ask. And then the managers help us tinker that out. So it's 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 truly set up uh, uh, collaboratively, but with that hierarchy that it, the institutional investors call the shots. Yeah. And one of the things you also mentioned to me, which ties in with what Emma was talking about in terms of partnerships, is the element of trust. That the good relationship between manager and, and investor, there is that level of transparency that Bass has mentioned, and trust. And we know that in, in other pieces of, of research that the strategic partnerships are based on trust uh, and what we uh, got from Bess's lecture, just to, or the, from the science talks, was also in terms of that collaboration across disciplines. And from the viewer, Grave Simonsen, thank you for this good question to you, Bess. It's very interesting what you said, Bess, about including the suppliers in the early phase. What are the experiences, the Dutch experiences, regarding public clients and the tender regulation? It is a subject matter we'll return to, but I'll just, I'd will just i like you to, to share the experiences now before we go on to the next topic. Yeah, I think a very good question from the audience, and, and, and uh, I think we will talk about that later on as well, but public procurement, uh, green public procurement is, I think, really a big enabler for every every assignment uh, within the public sector um, to make the shift to a circular economy and um, uh, there is al already a lot of knowledge about about that how to ask the question and um, often and, and I think I'm talking here about experiences here over the last couple of years but the people working on tendering uh, so the procurement guys and 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 and, and are um, not the specialist in circular economy yet. They are especially focusing on guiding the process, right? Talking about the managers of the projects, they are mainly focusing on uh, focusing on the budget, the planning, and the demands that they that they have from from their organizations. So there, we need the gap between these two um, to incorporate circular economy uh, within that field. And I really believe, and I think all the projects until the, today never were more expensive or, or took more time or were less uh, quality uh, um, at the end of the project where circular economy was, was part of, of that decision-making process. Um, so we, make to, we have to make it part of that process in both an uh, objective way so that you can really uh, um, compare uh, the bidders uh, from, from the, the very first moment, but also um, uh, incorporate uh, the subjective part of that because I don't want only to see the best plan, the best bid. I only want to select the best partner because we already agreed on that, that we have to do this together for a longer time. Uh, and it's not just one moment in time where we select the best uh, option, the, the best design out, out of, I don't know, 10 or even more. Um, but we have to do this together. 
uh, and that's why we have to select the, the right partner as well uh, to, to do that. And um, uh, I, 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 well, honestly, there is more than enough knowledge to do that. Um, we, we can start it right away, uh, but we have to feel the right moments, the right uh, uh, clients, the right partners to do that together. And I can remember uh, um, less than a year ago, together with GXN and also Minor Change Group around the Circle House project, um, Carl, you already mentioned it, uh, we had some brainstorm sessions around that. Uh, just to make an ambition, uh, a vision, to make that also practical uh, into awarding criteria and demands. And I'm really looking forward to do that in, in more and more of these kind of type of projects. Um, I think the time, is, the time is there for doing that. Thank you. And Emma, you wanted to comment on this? Yeah, I did. Um, I, just from a context, and then maybe we'll touch on sort of procurement slightly later, but um, I just think also it's interesting from an infrastructure perspective. So obviously still built environment, but not buildings. And of course, the, the development time for infrastructure is so ex extensive. It's such a long lead in time that um, what we can sometimes see is that circular economy strategies are designed and built, you know, or sorry, um, written at an early stage. And then when it comes to that procurement process, it's, you know, the, the market's not there. There's there's no access to the kind of ambitions that are outlined in the strategies themselves. And um, so I think just sort of reflecting on your point, Baz, I think um, market dialogue is, is really important in both the strategy level, um, but of course also that procurement level. And I think that's perhaps a, a way to at least mobilize on that, that sort of disconnect between procurement, perhaps not having that understanding yet of circular economy and, and how do we bring them into the conversations at an early stage, um, but also in, in terms of creating the strategy themselves, because obviously you need to have, um, there's a competition element, of course, in procurement and with, um, you know, big infrastructure projects as well, that's even more apparent. So um, I think that's where market dialogue and, you know, speaking at an early stage could be quite beneficial in um, in sort of hearing, you know, what, what's available and what might be available in in 10 years time or when the project actually gets to procurement phase um, and how can those particular organizations be involved in the project at an early phase as well. So I think it's an interesting um, sort of point, but I think market dialogue could be a, a way forward as well. I think the the the, word, the concept that you're talking about, the market dialogue, is quite interesting because when I, I spoke to Tona earlier this week, uh, Tona was also saying that when we're dealing with these circular solutions and on the, the, the journey towards an encompassing and scalable uh, circular solution, Tona, you basically said we need, we need it's not only the paradigm shift in terms of, of grasping uh, the, that sustainability is a, value, a variable, as Josine has said, the old the model was, was great in so many ways, it was lim linear and we had a price as a, a denominator and that was good, but now there are other variables that we have to bring into the equation. And based on that, what you were also highlighting, and I thought it was such a lovely uh, way of expressing it, that we, cannot, we have to move from the trade fair of demonstrating one gadget to a systemic export of showing the solutions. And, and following up on you, Emma, when you talk about the, ma the market dialogue and in, in changing, and we also spoke earlier in terms of the agility that we need in policy making, I'd, I'd like just for you to, to elaborate a little bit, Tona, on what is it that you're envisioning when you're saying we need to have the systemic export in play? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, completely right, Pernilla. And, and it's really interesting hearing you guys essentially uh, making it much more easy for uh, me uh, sitting here on the other side of the pond. Uh, because essentially what we of course are seeing over here is that the more mature these conversations uh, is getting back in Europe, uh, the more we get the value proposition down and so on, uh, the more attractive it becomes of course also in an American setting to, to bring these solutions over. Um, I'm uh, like Ko, I'm actually I'm a big advocate for this idea of, of uh, pilot testing and I think that is in many ways also where the Americans maybe are in some sense. Um, now that we do have the, the business case down, it's, it's time to now also on this side of the pond sort of showcasing how to do it. And that's what you're hinting to, Pernille, is essentially um, 
we have learned from doing this in many different industries uh, over decades. Um, a good example right now here in the U.S. is, of course, taking the entire offshore wind industry from Europe and sort of transferring it into an American setting. And it isn't just like you can't just do that, right? You have to create the local ecosystems essentially around these new industries. Um, and especially within circular economy, I think it's super important uh, because uh, all the solutions you talk about often have a very localized element. Uh, whether that's figuring out then where does this residual value actually fit into this new and different uh, sort of ecosystem that we have. Um, and, and also sort of touching a little bit on what Emma said and, 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 and Josine for that sake, I, I think what we see over here is that we need to start building these uh, projects and so on in order to even explore and figure out what are the policies that needs to be changed uh, because before we sort of get to the point of testing it out, we, we don't even know, we can't even sort of figure that out. Um, and we don't know what the, intu the investors will be asking for unless we start figuring, start doing it. Um, so, um, so, so this sort of idea of ecosystem development is really something that we are sort of a big proponents of and, and, and really try and work on and figure out how to do that. Excellent, because I know you, Jesper, sorry, I'll get back to you, Emma. I know you, Jesper, you, you also have a... a and almost, I would say passionate, and it is the right word, very passionate opinion in terms of the, how we need to focus on procurement, how we need to focus on, on policy making, also as we're developing the business models. And I'd, I'd like you to, to follow up a little bit on, on, on the various things that have been said at the moment to, to basically address that flex, the, the dialogue between the various business models that you guys are currently developing, as well as the need for agility with the policy makers in order to have the flexible procurement process. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks. Um, so, mostly we are working with um, within the construction sector. It's uh, low tech companies, and uh, many of the companies in in that sector is low tech. Uh, it means uh, concrete, it's wood, it's. Uh, but there's also high tech, of course, in that sector. Some of those uh, companies within uh, this sector, uh, low tech companies, also paint development and so on. Uh, I think they are having a hard time to get through this period. Uh, I, I think it's because the linear system is so good, uh, um, and to develop a new pro uh, product that can compete with a very structured process, that's that's uh, a challenge. I think. So we often see, and uh, those projects I have been part in, uh, we see that it's it will be in the beginning for those companies i think it will be a bit more a uh, exp bit more expensive before we industrialize the circular process so we have to get really volume into this process we're talking uh, tons and we systematic processes and so on that needs to be implemented in that sector before we can see reduction in costs on the product level and I agree on uh, on uh, again on call on the process that there's. I think there can be a really good road in that way. Um, I think on the procurement side, we have we have had projects and and products where we go to municipalities and uh, try to offer them, and what they look at is the price. So we have a circular product. We offer them. See, here is a circular product. We have take back. We have residual value. We have everything in place, and what will they? They will choose a, a product uh, produced far away, and with cheap labor, and and of course no sustainability. So there is for some companies in this sector a really hard time, and we ha we need also to find structures to support those companies in that tr transition in this. And I think the procurement tool, the procurement uh, and bus, you can talk about that as well. Um, I think that could be one of them, but also legislation on these things should companies have a take back system. And because I find it, it's, if we need to implement this take back system, and also, Bas, you can comment on that, we need the residual value implemented. We need to put value into those products 
And when they go to market, it's the company that have the responsibility to take it back and reuse it. So the design has to be in place. And when in that transition, we need help, uh, I think, from the government side. And I th- I, now I've been working also with the building suppliers and all that. And I can, again, just tell from a negative perspective, we need some help to do the transformation to really work this out because everything is about cost everything it it is we see of course i I see uh, upcoming ideas we need to do this we need need to move forward but in in the end this is about cost and and um and i think that that really needs a motor to move that process forward because we need the low-tech companies to move ahead also in this process. I can talk about the high-tech companies later. It's more easy, maybe, but uh, in, in, in that sector, it's weird. that that needs help. Now we have Emma, Cor, Bess on, on the list, uh, and I will uh, let Emma go first. So my point was uh, a little bit back towards what Tono was saying um, from a sort of the well, it's linked in, in a way to what you're saying, Jesper, around that procurement and government level. But I was just wondering, Tono, on um, sort of that city scale engagement perspective, what have you seen in terms of um, engagement from, from mayors and local mayors? And I think it's it's something we've seen from more of a, a climate agenda, um, particularly in uh, Arab as, as being a partner, knowledge partner to the C40 network. So supporting on climate action plans for cities. And I was just wondering how how we kind of bridge that and support that um, and sort of demonstrate that circular economy can also be a part of those action plans and whether there's something or an appetite in, in the States for that. No, absolutely. Um, it's actually been really interesting. I, over the last year or so, have participated in this like working group together with the city of New York, where we were trying essentially to create the value case for why is it that a large city like New York or even smaller cities, of course, should should engage in these topics. Um, and um, and it's been interesting to see that, of course, the American agenda, and especially these days, it is uh, so dependent on job creation. So maybe it's one of the things that we haven't talked so much about in Europe, essentially, is that when the Americans talk about the value of circular economy from a mayoral perspective, it's often about high quality jobs. Uh, and the idea of being able to create localized supply chains uh, around circularity that are really attractive to them and are really attractive to uh, the people who are essentially going to vote for them, hopefully, uh, down the line. Um, so that's one of the things that I think is quite different. Um, but absolutely lots of interest, also from the climate perspective. Um, but this build back greener, this, this building back how to recover in the U.S. is enormously important. Um, Mm. The other thing that we also looked a lot on in that, which is also um, like in in some cases a little bit more American, is the the idea of how circular economy can be a driver of of just and more uh, equal uh, society. Mm. So, you know, when we talked a lot about like, what do we do with building stock and so on, it was often a matter of how can we share the assets better? How can circular economy and these ideas be part of uh, enabling uh, also low-income communities to access the buildings or use that those assets and so on. So that that's really interesting and some of the things that we see that at least I experienced that are different and what really gets mayors and, and cities over here excited about this agenda. That's really I interesting. Also, the sorry, I was just going to just just finish on that. That the EU Green Deal obviously is reflecting quite a lot around that job creation and just transition. So I think that's interesting that that is maybe not translating directly, but that that's that's an angle that, that gains traction. It's good. Core. You're muted. Here we are. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. And I just wanted to pick up on uh, Jesper's point about cost. It's 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 certainly true, and that was also Josian's point earlier. We have a system that's been super optimizing itself over the last hundred years for at least one parameter, and that's cost. That means that if you're gonna ent- go into that market and, and try and come in, you are on a very sort of unequal playing field. Cost of your product could be one thing. I think figuring out other ways of talking about price and costs is, is one way to shift that. I mean, the other thing is, is to shift the overall perspective, which is what I got a little bit from Josie and what, what Tona was also just saying about. 
we don't have to just compete on cost. We have learned here in Denmark, and I'm sure in, in other places in Europe and probably also in the States, to compete on um, on energy. So, you know, we, we used to compete on price per square meter. Now we compete on price per square meter and uh, kilowatt hours per square meter, basically. And increasingly, we could be competing on uh, carbon per square meter. And so I'm, I'm, I would be wanting to maybe push Josie a little bit more to hear about that process from where you're sitting of actually not just changing, but changing the paradigm. You know, what is it actually for the parameters that we're going with and how can we take that sort of discussion that you're having and actually really push that into the building environment better? Yeah, a, a, a big, big ask there, but <laughs> thank you. Now, um, I mean, with a paradigm shift, you, you, should, you can't do this. You have to trust that it's happening, right? That's, that's the first thing I would like to say. But you can really see, I, well, I, I'm seeing it all the time, but I might be sort of lopsided in my view uh, that, that, that that is happening. And one thing I find very interesting is what you've seen. So we, we went from that mono, I would call it mono uh, variable uh, approach of the, the historical paradigm to this idea, oh gosh, there might be some more variables that we need to fi figure in. And that process is quite an interesting one because, um, well, it started with carbon, like we said, but what we're seeing right now, and I think that's where, where we are in this point, we're seeing that um, we're, the investor community is realizing that everything they do has both positive and negative impacts. And, you know, carbon is a, a clear example of a negative impact. But of course, especially on infrastructure, you know, sometimes you need to put a metro line in place because it's actually a very positive impact as well. So, and, and the most advanced uh, investors out there are actually start, starting to get a grapple with, with every investment decision comes a whole suite of positive and negative impacts. And, you know, getting that data in, getting that and, and navigating that type of um, environment in a, in a good way together. I mean, it's it's a huge ask, um, but it's 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 something we're we're currently we have technology. We're all super smart. We've you know we've 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 been well fed and well clothed for years. So most likely the industry is really ready to do this this big transition towards taking this these these variables in. And that's that's what I'm what I'm seeing happening right now. One one good example of that is is all these investors coming together in these big. Uh, s sustainable development goals type of, you know, targeted uh, uh, groups saying, guys, we are going to do this right now. And there is no, you know, there, there's, in essence, there's no alternative. Uh, Trump, Trump never, never had an alternative. He was just trying to keep something which was inevitable. Uh, he, he was trying to hold that back. So, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating time. Yeah. Excellent. Thank, thank you. Have, if I may just we, pick up we have, on, on I'm just one going thing to interrupt there. your call because we also oh. have a very active uh, the viewers. So uh, I knew that we, you would be able to to discuss and debate for for a long time. But we have we have some wonderful questions. Now, part of what you were also uh, asked by me to, to, to think about uh, just a little bit was in terms of what, what more do we need to successfully ensure the full green transition. Now, that question in mind, I'm just going to read to you uh, some of the, the questions that we have received because I think it's, uh, it ties in very well with the, with the closing remarks. Uh, we have the question from... Um, a chuck to call. Do you think a common methodology of evaluating material reuse values and defining reuse strategies could scale up circular material economy? Follow up question to that. Is certification the way forward? I'll let you contemplate and I'll go on with the other questions. That way we can take a final round from all of you afterwards. Gravis, there is a, or best, there is a comment on your reply to Gravis's question. And Gravis uh, uh, writes, and thank you, Gravis, for taking, for actually for doing this. It's wonderful. I agree, best, but I think we also have to work on the system level and not only on the individual projects to make the real changes. I think this is what you've also addressed just now, but still, in fairness. And Gauss continues, of course we have to focus on recreating a comparing market, but how do you uh, view on using regulators, as, i.e. taxes, to lead the market into the right direction? And I think that ties very well with Jesper's uh, questions as well. 
So, and then there is one final question that is a slightly out of line with this sequence of questions, but I'm going to mention it anyway. Beth said that in the Venlo case, they couldn't reuse much, a lot of the materials from the old building. Uh, do the rest of you, Emma and Cor and Jesper, do you have reflections from the projects that you have been in on that maybe are different to that? So those are the questions that we have. So do we need certification? Do we need taxes and regulations? Is, is that what we need to ensure the, what I have uh, labeled the highway to green heaven? Uh, I, and we'll, this time as the closing comments and reflections, we will again start with the ladies first. So Emma, I'll let you go first. I've got the shortest time to think about that, but <laughs> um, some interesting, yeah, really interesting questions. Um, I think overall reflection, I, I, I really value the point about that systemic change and system change. So I think going across all the points raised today about the importance of collaboration and, um, you know, that partnership across the different levels, um, I think has come out, you know, really strongly. I think it's interesting that the point raised there about certification and, and sort of taxation and regulation, I think in some cases, I think that does work and it has more traditionally worked um, from sort of sustainable buildings perspectives and, and looking at sort of sustainable certifications and mobilizing on that. Um, and I also think that's a useful source of, of collating data and information. but how we really utilize that to create that systemic change i think that's really crucial kind of the next phase of certification you know what how do we use that in a way that demands and the change on a systemic level um and i think just you you've mentioned some points there about that investor you know they're sort of waking up to the facts both positive and negative um, and i think that's a really interesting sort of perspective that you know, where, where do we go next and how do we use the tools and methods that we have in place to mobilize that next phase? Um, but I think that systemic level change is really important across, as I mentioned, sort of the different levels, um, you know, from a policy landscape and through down to um, sort of resource use. Um, I think that's, that's really critical. Thank you very much. And Josine, would you like to pass your, share your, your, your reflections? Yeah, yeah I'd love to, uh, to add to what Emma's saying, and I, I so agree with that as well. Um, I, I would take the angle of, of uh, what, one of the things that makes me very optimistic is the European Commission and the way they understand this shift and change and are doing what they can. Uh, so, you know, one thing they can't do, they can't do taxes clearly. So that's, that's off the table for the EU. But what they can do, and that's uh, uh, my favorite bit of legislation, which is coming up, is SFDR. And SFDR is it's very like GRESP. It's obliging all these large institutional investors to start reporting on these 32 uh, material non-financial metrics. And what are you going to see is, and this is starting in, uh, in the beginning of 2021, uh, the 1st first, first of January, you're going to see these, these, this data coming on board and people, again, doing all the games that we're also doing, you know, who's better at this, who's doing that. And then, so the, this, this very natural navigating of doing the right thing, which we all truly want to do, is going to happen because of transparency on these, these important uh, critical metrics. So that's my, my word of hope, Wonderful. I hope. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Tone, on to you. Yeah, absolutely. No, very good questions. And, and I think, again, me maybe sort of bringing the, the American side into that um, procurement and taxation means to sort of uh, create uh, a circular economy and systemic change is, uh, is not traditionally the route they've chosen over here. And so in that sense, I, I think that's also why I uh, talk more about the ecosystem, uh, because I, I think what we will see over here is sort of this bottom up or like round up kind of effect instead. That, that it will come from come from that means. I think many of them, uh, when I, for, for instance, participated in this like working group, they envy us from having a, a European a commission that can really set forward a path and so on and, and, and do it in such a coordinated and, and systemic way. 
Um, but I think the Americans know that they have to do it essentially the, the opposite way around. Um, so that's really interesting and, and seeing how they're going to go about that. And, that, and that's why the, the job perspectives and, and the economics of it may be a bigger role over here. So, yeah, super interesting. Lots yes. of optimism, but super interesting. It's fascinating. And, different ways of doing it. and Bess, your closing reflections? Yes, well, I think uh, seeing the questions that we have a very good public today, uh, asking very, uh, very clever questions, um, talking about the system change. Yes, of course, indeed, we need to do this together uh, to, to make this all happen. Um, I think if we go into the certification, uh, I think certification is always a mean. It, it is not a goal on itself. So uh, let, let's make uh, having certified materials or building uh, as a proof that we are on the right way. Uh, but it's not a goal on itself of having only cradle, uh, cradle to cradle certified or BREEAM or LEED or whatsoever uh, certifications we have. I've once heard that we have over 450 sustainable certifications, so we can choose whatever we would like. But uh, I think we all agree on the on the on the goal and the ambition we we want to to go for. Um, one thing what what makes me also positive is that that becomes more and more evidence of uh, that this is the right way doing. Uh, we see a lot of research on that uh, and maybe reflecting on what Jesper was saying on circular procurement. Uh, I think he was right that from a um, uh, private point of view that more than 80% of the, the tenders, for example, are focusing on lowest price. Uh, so I think we have to make a change there because it is not clever doing that. Um, and there is research which proves that having more than 30% in your tender focusing on points on uh, on price, it, it doesn't make sense to do it more over than 30%. So, mm. it, which means that 70% or even more uh, can, can evaluate it on quality level. And let's make quality then reflecting on circular economy and sustainability. Uh, and I think that there, there is a big opportunity and what Jesper was saying here as well uh, before is there are a lot of tools there. Uh, we ourselves made once a circular uh, tender toolkit. So I think there is more enough information to share on this topic and, and, and to help people guiding them in making first steps uh, and to make this, this happen. So I'm always positive, but I think also what's happening around us is that, uh, that there is a lot of knowledge and, and, and will to, to, to go for that. Thank, Thank you so very much. And Jesper, your last reflections? Yeah, I'll just say that this uh, ship will not turn around. It will keep moving forward. So that's the way, that's what we're going to see. Uh, even though we will have some struggles and we don't have time to wait, so we have to speed up. And therefore we need some systemic changes as well. Uh, on some of the projects we're working on uh, within the water sector, we see really good business opportunities. We can see that we can earn money. We see that we can come in with new business models. And that's there, there are many of those uh, uh, companies that, are, that can do that. But we, as I said, we also need to focus on other industries than those who are doing well. Uh, we need this uh, legislation to, to be more clear and helpful uh, in this transition. And it, not necessarily on certifications, but on documentation. Uh, that people need to document the, what is inside their products, and they also have to guarantee takebacks and residual values for the future. In that way, we will secure our resources in the future. And I think maybe that have to go a bit more faster than it's. Um, yeah. So it's it's just my final word. So let's uh, yeah make some business out there. Thank you, Jesper. And on to you, Cole. Yes, yeah, so I have the, the most time to reflect. I'm not sure my answer is going to uh, really reflect that. But um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's great audience questions as well. I think a lot of clever stuff has already been said about certification. I might just add that certification makes it easy for uh, institutional investors, for example, to ask for something. Uh, you know, you can say we're only doing uh, gold certified, whatever. Uh, buildings from now on. So in that sense, certification is, is, is an important tool. I'm not sure it's enough. And I definitely would agree with Bass that, you know, certification for certification's sake is, is hardly interesting. Uh, the same 
tool sort of goes with the with the standards. Uh, we haven't talked much about that, but we're working with the Danish Standards Organization, which right now are starting up a, I believe it's a subcommittee, not a full committee, but a subcommittee to look at, at shared European standards for aspects of circular economy. Again, these types of standards can make it easier for a procurer to ask for a uh, circular economy. What do, you, what do you actually ask for when you ask for a circular building? Bass knows a lot about this, but if we could standardize that, that would help uh, procurers uh, ask for these things as well. And then I believe there's a question if, if, if we as an industry needed a, a shared uh, tool to, to understand the uh, impact of materials and, and end of life scenarios. Um, it's an interesting question and, and I believe if we're talking about sort of one tool to rule them all, I, I don't think the answer is yes. I think that building a platform for something that is complex as, as the building environment is going to be very tricky. But what we need is shareable data and data that we are all sort of agreeing on the basic formats of. So we know that if we, we know we are comparing uh, and so that we know, and this goes back to Josie's point about expanding uh, what we're looking at when we're looking at the impact of investment, both positive and negative. So we can start understanding the parameters we can evaluate from and understanding the impacts and generate cases and an understanding that's shared so we know what's what's feasible uh, moving forward. So maybe it's not a question of, of necessarily creating one tool, but it's a, a question of creating the data frameworks that allow us to maybe use different tools, but share the results of those tools in a meaningful way. But yeah, the ship, the ship on the turn, I, I agree with you, Jesper. Uh, I, I could almost, uh, I'm tempted to start another debate, and of course uh, we don't have time for that. But just to, to uh, pick up on what you just said in terms of that we need uh, different sets of data. And it brings me back to a conversation I had with Josine prior to this debate. The spreadsheet is not able to fathom multiple levels, the manifold complexity of data. And this is the true testament to the, sh the paradigm shift that we are currently witnessing. But the data platform can encompass all these various types of, of data. The human mind is amazing, it can do so many things, but there is a level of complexity in this paradigm shift that, that it, we cannot fathom alone. So I think Josine would, would co completely agree with you, Cole. It's, it's time for me to, to, to say thank you and uh, I, I want to bow a massive deep bow of respect to you guys for what you have been able to convey in, in, in the last hour and a half. To the viewers, I thank you for your patience because we had some audio difficulties which has also meant that we uh, talked a little bit more because we had to catch up with that, but it, I, th I hope you found it worthwhile the time to stay on and continue because I think what you have addressed is exactly the complexity that Cor also told me when I interviewed Cor prior to today. Now, Namely, the fascination of construction is that the process is actually repetitive. It happens over and over again. That allows us the opportunity of scalability, of standardization, and of copying what works. But in a pra paradigm shift, we cannot copy what we've done before. We have to go the new ways. And that is where there is a schism that the abstract of this repetitiveness of the standardization of the process that has repeated itself for centuries. Now we have to find new ways because we have to develop new languages. Bess has tossed, touched upon that in terms of cross-disciplinary collaboration. Josine has as well. Emma, you raised the need for strategic partnerships. And I think, Tony, you just also brought raise our awareness and just brought to mind that we may focus on cost, we may focus on legislation, we may focus on procurement, but there is also another, in other parts of the world, there is another sense of urgency where the argument of job creation and high-skilled job creation is really also a play. It's not time to be philosophical because we're running out of time. Yet I would say we didn't only sigh a relief a few weeks ago, but I also think that you feel in today's debate the sense of passion, the sense of urgency from the panelists. We are here. We will not turn around, as Jesper said. The ship has left the harbor, as it were. We've set sails. We are embarking on the new frontier towards the green heaven. And 
with that, I also know that in this, during this debate, to you viewers, we've sent you a thank you mail for your participation. Please take a look at it because we'd love to see you again. To our amazing panelists, thank you, thank you, thank you. It is the human touch that will make us create the tomorrow that we so want to. So even though you're not with us at Blocks Up, I, I felt your presence here today, and I felt your vision and your commitment and your experience and your wisdom. And I so look forward to greeting you in Blocks Up, have you, the viewers, with us at Blocks Up, where we can continue this debate. If you were here, we would, of course, continue over a glass of wine. Bear that in mind when I bid you adieu. I look forward to welcoming you again, and thank you, and have a great day wherever you are watching. Bye.